The growing income inequality among the API community is both something we're familiar with, unfortunately, in America, and also something that is idiosyncratic to the Asian American Pacific Islander community. My parents are your typical boat people. They fled Vietnam during the war by boat. My parents had me, didn't speak English, didn't have any money, but they put themselves through community college. Asian Americans represent 12% of the workforce in the United States, but are less likely to be promoted to management positions and face higher levels of long-term unemployment than other races. My mom left school when she was 12 years old to work in a sewing machine factory. She didn't have to work the system to find out who's who. And it was this experience that led to the two of us hitting a brick wall when she was laid off. It wasn't until I arrived at Harvard as a first-generation low-income college student that I realized those who end up getting these jobs are navigating the system in a very different way. Being a woman and being a minority, I was never taught to, you need to ask for more. It was like, you should feel lucky you got the job. Just one of many cultural differences. There can be a lot of social pressure that comes from your family to become a doctor or to become an engineer. I became a newspaper reporter where I wasn't making very much money. Then I quit that job. Then I traveled and was essentially glorified unemployed for two years. Then I started my own business. Everyone thought I was nuts and I wasn't getting an arranged marriage. It wasn't until my podcast hit 20 million downloads that my family could actually see, wow, she can be successful. These finance professionals, authors, and influencers have learned from their parents, their cultures, themselves, through education and those around them. And now they're paying it forward, sharing their stories to help the next generation you're going to achieve the most. You're going to do the best, make the biggest contributions, and have the greatest levels of happiness in the field that calls to you. Empower yourselves to really read and learn. The hope is to make a difference in the lives of our youth and those who come after them. The next generation, all of us, are in desperate need of your leadership, of your ideas, of your passion, of your care to the world, especially to those who are coming from underrepresented backgrounds and humble beginnings. We need more leaders like you. So please don't give up because we desperately need your ideas and need your talent. All right, everyone. And that's exactly why we are all gathered here today to talk a little bit more about that next generation of savers, investors, professionals, entrepreneurs, and to help everybody on their own own your money before it owns you. So greetings, I'm Dominic Chu. I'm the senior markets correspondent here at CNBC. Joined today by three financial experts and influencers that you just got a sampling of content from. First of all, we'll start with Gorik Ng. He's the author of The Unspoken Rules, Secrets to Starting Your Career Off Right. He's a first-generation graduate, as you heard, of Harvard College, where he is now a career advisor specializing in coaching first-generation and lower-income background students. We have next Ann Tran, who is a managing partner at Sage Mint Wealth. She is a Goldman Sachs alum who previously worked as an attorney in their private wealth division and then later on as a vice president of their financial counseling group. And then there's Paula Pant, She's the host of the Afford Anything podcast, where she focuses on how to build financial independence, something that we all want at various points in our lives. So thank you all very much for being with us. We really appreciate Paula, Gorick, and Anne for sure being with us here. And, and perhaps maybe Anne will kick off our program with you. This is a very timely topic, personal finances, investing, life hacks, if you will, given everything that's happening with the roller coaster ride we've been seeing in the markets right now. What are the younger clients that you have at Sage while so, so concerned about? What are they approaching you about? What kind of questions do they have? Are they scared of inflation? Are they talking about their jobs or the housing market? What's really top of mind? Thanks for having me today, Dominic. I think it is unsettling times. There are a lot of things going on right now for our younger investors. And, you know, unfortunately, they've they've come to a point where they're experiencing a lot of things. You know, maybe we experience inflation at some point in time. There is a pandemic and another. But in this situation, we are seeing everything happen all at once. 
um, you know, our younger clients or younger investors, they are, they're scared, they're concerned about what should they do because a lot of them have not been through this before. You know, some of them may have been through 2008 recession and remember what happened then, but really for a lot of our younger investors in their 20s and 30s, these are their peak years where they're just starting to graduate from school, get a job, earn money, and now they're seeing their hard earned dollars you know, lose in the stock market because of the volatility. So I think a lot of times what, you know, as a financial advisor, what we want to do to our, for our clients is really remind them that when we're investing, we have to invest for the long term, right? And my job and my role as their advisor is really to help them control the temperament and the behaviors and the emotions of the stock market. That is your worst enemy when you are investing are your emotions. And so for us, it's more important now than ever to make sure that we create a long-term plan, a strategy for our clients so that they know that volatility is supposed to happen. Our goal is to make sure that we create a portfolio for our clients that can sustain fluctuations, but really don't have long-term losses, right? We're, we're looking at this long-term. So we wanna make sure that we make sure that our clients are able to really take the emotion out of this. Now, I know it's scary, it is scary. We see the news, we see the headlines, we see inflation costs, we see groceries going up. I bought grapes the other day and I can't believe how expensive grapes are. Uh, we go pump gas and my gosh, it's, you know, the, the prices are astronomical. I live in California, so the gas prices here, you know, $6, more than $6. So these things that we are experiencing in our day-to-day -day lives can be really scary and they really can cause a lot of instability for us to be concerned about what to do. Um, my one advice though really is to continue to invest. I know it's scary and, and I know a lot of times when we see the volatility in the markets right now, a lot of people want to pull out. I have clients asking, should we go to cash, especially the younger clients? But really these are the times that you should take advantage of the market's volatility and continue to invest, continue sure. to invest your 401k, right? And continue to make those monthly investments. It's so important and critical for you to build your wealth that way. I mean, of course, as a, as a former registered investment advisor representative of myself, the, the whole idea of trying to tell your clients about dollar cost averaging is, is massive in an environment where you have a downdraft like you're seeing right now, especially if you don't need the money for a handful of years going forward. I mean, that brings us to a good point, Gorg. Those people who have the benefit of seeing market cycles in the past have kind of understood that these things ebb and flow and they go in cycles. How about some of those first generation Americans here though? The, you know, those who are uh, sons and daughters of immigrants or, or those who are kind of experiencing the American life economy and markets for the first time as young adults here, how do they get up to speed on what's happening right now? Thanks so much for having me, Dom, and it's a privilege to be sharing the stage with all of you. To first gens here and first gens everywhere, it's helpful to think about your career as requiring three key ingredients in your financial wellness as well. The first is what you know and what you can do, which are your hard skills. The second is how you sell yourself and how you sell your ideas, which are your soft skills. And the third is how you navigate the system, which I think of as your navigational skills. And each of these three elements are necessary, but they're not sufficient, where it can be tempting sometimes to put your head down, to do the hard work, and to expect that the hard work will just speak for itself and that your contributions today in working hard and pulling those long hours will eventually pay off. However, as all of us who have navigated the system know, that is only necessary, it's not sufficient. It's also about navigating the system, navigating the turbulence, navigating the ambiguity. And so to that end, the best thing that folks can do is to find someone who's been in their shoes before, someone like Anne, someone like who that they can relate to, who can tell them what they did when they were in their position not too long ago, what decisions they made, what they did well in, and more importantly, what they regretted. All of us are going to have our own paths, whether it's financially, whether it's in terms of personal life and career, but there are many people who have been in your shoes before, even if you're first gen. And understanding what decisions others have made can help take the trial and error out of your decision-making process and pave a smoother path for you to getting to your financial and your professional career goals. Oh, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I, th this idea that I, I've made it, you know, I, I think the biggest thing for me intuitively was to try to 
learn and, and kind of from the mistakes of others and kind of take those historical precedents and incorporate them in my own, my own life so I don't have to make those mistakes myself. Paula, I, I'd like to get some of your thoughts here before we get into some of our Q&A program here. I, I'm curious, many of us have dreams about becoming financially independent. You know, I keep joking to my wife, I wanna get to a point where I can retire early. I mean, mm -hmm. how exactly, your story during that, that video was, was fascinating to me. How exactly were you able to become financially independent after quitting your job uh, and, and kind of live life the way that you do now? Sure, well, there are two ways I can answer that. So your question was about my story. And when I, at the time that I quit my job, I was not yet financially independent, that came later. At the time that I quit my job, I had enough money saved to live for about two years. I had a two year runway and that, to apply this uh, lesson to everyone, um, having a runway, having an emergency fund or a cash cushion that can give you some leeway, particularly right now when there's, you know, possibly the risk of a recession, maybe, you know, that's a, that's a good lesson for everyone, regardless of whether you want to quit your job or not. But then to your, the other aspect of your question, which is how uh, does a person, how did I, and how can others build financial independence? And for me, that came later, long after I quit my job, long after I started my business. Um, that financial independence was built by methodically, uh, you know, as, as Gorik and Ann have talked about, dollar cost averaging into the market, just keep buying, right? Just keep investing, whether the market's up, whether the market's down. Um, it's very much a, a function of increasing the gap between what you earn and what you spend, and then taking that gap and putting it into investments. And then you just keep doing that over and over and over, regardless of what's happening in the markets for uh, a sustained period of time. All right, that's, uh, those are great things to kind of highlight this idea that it really does at times come down to simplicity. Uh, mm -hmm spend less than you earn and then kind of do something with the disposable income there. All right, so let's get right into some of the questions that we have here because that's the whole point of this, getting some of those real responses from real world folks out there who are dealing with everything that we've been talking about in terms of hurdles. We have a question, first of all, from a 23 year old named Mitch. He's in da or Dallas, Texas right now. And Mitch is out there. He's a member of the Junior Achievement Alumni Network. So let's listen to what his question is. What are some things that I can do to prepare myself for a hypothetical uh, recession? Thank you. Okay, so Anne, why don't we take a first stab at this with you? Um, in terms of the overall picture, you're, you're the financial advisor here. How exactly do we prepare ourselves for a recession? Sure. And Mitch, thank you for your question. So I think Paula hit it spot on was making sure that you have a runway, right? I think during times of recessions, the one thing that we really reiterate to our clients is making sure that you continue to add to your emergency funds. It's critical to build that cash savings, making sure that you have enough cash to last you at least six months, even to a year, because during times of recession, we see people lose jobs, maybe their wages are cut. And so those are times when we, re we really need to stock up on our cash. And there's things that we can do that maybe um, you know, we can alter some of our lifestyle needs. So if things are broken, maybe we don't get something new and maybe we fix it. Like if you have a leaky roof, you can fix that roof instead of replacing it with a new roof, right? So those are things that we can do to consider during these times, how do we minimize our spending? How do we continue to increase our cash flow? And if you have loans or debt, making sure that we minimize any of our credit cards that have high interest um, high interest rates on there. And then school loans, there's opportunities to look for maybe loan repayment options. So really during times of recession, the key thing that you can do is continue to build your cash savings. All right, now Paula, with regard to that, I mean, recessions in times of financial stress are all about uh, resource allocation, right? It's like mm -hmm. economics 101. Your podcast is actually called Afford Anything. But I'm assuming you can't afford everything, right? Certainly not. We have limited resources. So how exactly do you sustain this ability to afford anything in a time of recession? And how exactly do you have to change your mindset in times of economic distress? Sure, absolutely. So the concept of affording anything is the concept of setting priorities. You know, you hit it, uh, you hit the nail on the head when you said anything, but not everything. So every choice that you make is a trade-off against something else. And oftentimes, uh, we are 
unaware or unconscious of these trade-offs. It can be easy to think in a vacuum, yes, I would like to purchase X, Y, Z item, but we don't often think about the fact that by virtue of purchasing that item, we are necessarily not purchasing A, B, or C item. And so um, becoming really conscious of those trade-offs, particularly when there's a recession and you know that um, money might be tighter, there may be, depending on the industry that you're in, there may be an increased risk that you might lose your job. Um, you often feel like, you know, so much of uh, the way we spend is psychological and by seeing your portfolio balances decline, you often feel a little bit worse. And sometimes that leads to spending that you're doing for the sake of, uh, you know, kind of a, an emotional band-aid rather than because you actually truly need or want this item. So uh, the, the practice of really checking in with yourself and asking yourself if this purchase is aligned with your values and your priorities, um, that is, wis I mean, wisdom that can take you through any market, whether it's a bull or a bear, but particularly in times of distress. All right, it's kind of like, we're, I mean, we're, we're not technically in a recession right now, but there's obviously increased chatter about this notion that there could be a slowdown coming soon. Uh, with that in mind, let's get out to our next question. Uh, this one comes out from um, the land of Sagement and also my native land in California. So let's take a listen to this question from California. Hi, my name is Dan and my question is, what percentage of my income as an entrepreneur should I be setting aside for taxes, for my personal savings and for reinvesting in the business? Thanks so much for taking the time to answer these questions. All right, so I know that all of you have some kind of input. This, this taps on areas of all of your expertise right now. Um, so this is an entrepreneur, and why don't you start us off with this one here. How exactly, as an entrepreneur, do you kind of go about allocating for some of those types of expenses and, and investments? Right. Well, I guess you would allocate all of it, first of all, <laughs> all of it to, to everything, because being an entrepreneur and starting off your own practice and business really requires you to allocate all your sources to everything that you just talked about. So your taxes, your savings, reinvesting in the business. You know, when I started my practice, I pretty much paid myself a very nominal amount and put most of it back into the business because that's what we do as entrepreneurs. Um, you know, and so it's really hard as an entrepreneur to really take a step back and reevaluate your finances and see what is it that you need to allocate into what bucket, right? So to answer the question though, you know, as a rule of thumb, I would say I always uh, advise to try to allocate at least 20% into savings, into investments, because as we've mentioned before, the importance of dollar cost averaging, the minute you stop and you don't invest, it's really going to, your portfolio will really take a hit in the long run. So every dollar counts, even as an entrepreneur, I know you want to put the money back into the business, but it's so important to continue to invest as much as you can, at least, you know, if you can't do 20%, something. Um, and then the rule, the rule of thumb for taxes, really, one, it depends on your tax bracket. I would say you probably hear between 20 to 30 percent looking at your after your net profits, what that looks like to determine how much you should save for taxes. I love that you're even thinking about taxes because a lot of times I know that's the surprise factor that some entrepreneurs may not plan for. So putting a little bit away, 20 to 30 percent, depending on what your tax bracket is. Um, is always good for your taxes. So come tax time, you're not left with a big surprise. Um, and what should you put back into the business also depends on the stage and where your business is at. You know, I think in the beginning, most entrepreneurs do put most of their profits back into the business, but I think it is dependent on where you are in your business and what you're trying to accomplish. All right, that's a great answer for that one with regard to kind of entrepreneurs. Uh, Paula, I, I kind of wonder, this This kind of gets us into the budgeting discussion, right? Because mm -hmm. you're going to allocate into these buckets and whatnot. Uh, you know, in the past, you've kind of made mention in, in, in your podcast and in your, in, your, in your social dealings about the budgeting process being like calorie counting. I yeah. mean, it's almost not like cal it, it is calorie counting, right? You, got, mm -hmm. you, have a, you have a fixed bucket there and you have to kind of, kind of divvy it all up. Can you elaborate, though, a little bit about how, how you view that budgeting process? Sure. So the traditional way that budgeting is often talked uh, talked about or taught is to be incredibly meticulous and have a detailed line itemed breakdown uh, of this is the amount of money that goes towards 
housing. This is what goes to transportation. This goes to entertainment or just, you know, uh, clothing. The problem with that, it sounds great in theory, but the problem with that is that it is like the calorie counting of the financial world. You can, most people can sustain it for a few weeks, maybe a few months, but it is very hard to sustain that level of meticulous detail over time. Now, if you are one of those people who can do it and who can do it sustainably, that's great. Uh, I love that for you. But for those of us who cannot, and myself included, what uh, I like to advocate for is what I refer to as the anti-budget. And the anti-budget is the intuitive eating uh, analog. So uh, with the anti-budget, you cut to the chase. You say, you know what, how much of my money do I want to save? And in this context, I'm using the word save to refer to anything that improves your net worth, whether that's literal savings in a savings account or contributions to a retirement account or additional payments towards a debt above and beyond the minimum payment required. Any net worth improvement is what I mean when I say save. So decide how much you want to save, whether that's a percentage or a raw dollar amount. Do that first and whatever is left over is yours to spend. All right, so that's a pretty easy way to do it. And in fact, I like that because it kind of keeps things more on the macro level. You know, you, you don't have to miss the forest for the trees, that sort of thing. Uh, let, let's now, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, esteemed panel, let's head over to international waters. Let's go to Bahrain, where we have another young man also involved with the Junior Achievement Program on the international level. And so let's go over to Bahrain. Hi, my name is Sultan Bouachouan. Thank you for having me. As a current investor in multiple U.S.-based equities, the current uncertainty and panic in the market is negatively impacting a portion of my net worth. Do you believe that the 50 basis points interest hikes will continue to negatively impact the market and therefore my portfolio? And do you believe that cryptocurrency is a good hedge against the current uncertainty in the market? Thank you. Wow, that's a lot to unpack. It's almost like a doctoral thesis if you <laughs> in, my, in my mind. All right, so there's there's a, a couple of big themes there. So so maybe Anne, we'll we'll go to you for this one here. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, first of all, none of us are mind or, or future fortune tellers, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but let's talk about markets, the economy, uh, interest rate hikes from a big picture level. Uh, uncertainty in the market, and then maybe we'll get to a little bit about the whole cryptocurrency side of things. Sure, that is a loaded question. So, so to address the the interest rates hikes, you know, I I personally don't feel the volatility of the markets currently is not directly related to the 50 basis point hike. In fact, we've gone through many hikes before. I think this is a result of everything else that's going on. We've got inflation, we've got geopolitical issues, we've got the war in Russia and Ukraine. Um, inf you know, all of that has a combination and has caused the volatility markets, not necessarily just the Fed's raising rates. So I think that that particular part of the question there um, you know, I think there's a lot of different aspects of what's going on in the world that's affecting the portfolio. Um, and then to just quickly answer on the crypto, my, my quick answer here is just look at the data this year, right? The, the data on crypto is what was touted to be an inflation hedge is clearly not. Um, it has been completely correlated with the markets and is down with the markets. And so it has not been an inflation hedge and I would not consider crypto to be an inflation hedge. All right, uh, if, Anne, if you, if you don't mind, could I just follow up very briefly with, sure, with that absolutely. one? Because the only reason why I ask is because, you know, there are different kind of research studies and polls about, you know, the, the awareness of or the propensity towards drifting towards things like cryptocurrencies. Uh, this, is, uh, this is data from the Pew Research Center, by the way, just so you know. It says that Asian adults are more likely than black, Hispanic, and even white adults to say that they have ever invested in or traded or used a cryptocurrency overall. Also 43% of those surveyed say that they had heard a lot about cryptocurrency compared to just 29% of a similar placed Hispanic adults and about a quarter of black or white adults. So, so Anne, I mean, is there a reason why Asians, at least from a statistical standpoint, seem to be more kind of in that cryptocurrency sphere? So I think that Part of the reason for that is is just the overall wanting to understand what's going on in the current markets. So I think from a from an 
a perspective of looking at where are we at, what is going on in the world, where are the markets going, the volatility, and crypto is something that is constantly being talked about in the news and in the markets. Um, I think those are some interesting statistics, statistics that you just mentioned as to the Asian families that have heard about cryptocurrency but are not invested in it, right? And I think that's part of wanting to understand, wanting to see what everybody is doing, what the craze is about, um, but not necessarily wanting to be an investor into the crypto world. Gotcha. I mean, it's obviously a very complex to topic for sure there. So we'll have to kind of figure out whether or not there's any kind of a dollar cost averaging or cut your losses type approach that a lot of people are using for that crypto at least downdraft that we're seeing right now. Uh, we have our next question, by the way, now coming all the way from the Lone Star State. This is a question from Austin, Texas. So let's take a listen here. Hi, my name is Eric Lynn. Thanks for having me. My question is, how can young professionals take advantage of the current bear market to start and grow their retirement and investment portfolios? Thank you. Oh, all right. That's the, uh, first of all, that's easy because you're buying low right now, right? At least from a relative basis. Paula, why don't you tell us a little bit about this um, I guess, I mean, people refer to it as the fire movement, right? And this is mm -hmm. kind of like the centerpiece of a lot of what you talk about. This is the whole idea of becoming financially independent, FI, mm -hmm. yes. and then retiring early, RE, right? The fire movement. Uh, any tips you might have for somebody like Eric, maybe others like him for planning on retirement, whether it be traditionally later in life or, or maybe earlier on? Well, so uh, so to answer Eric's question about the bear markets and then to tie that into how a person could uh, plan for retirement, regardless of when that retirement is, um, Eric, if you as as a young investor who does not have a lot in the markets right now, but is enthusiastic about getting in uh, a dip is your best friend. So buy the dip, you know, take advantage of the fact that prices are low right now and don't try to time the market. Don't worry about is it going to go lower? Um, you know, just just time in the market is more important than time in the market. So uh, put as much money as you reasonably can into the market and keep at it. Keep uh, keep accumulating assets. Now, to uh, your question about retirement, the thing is, regardless of whether you want to retire at the age of 35, 45, 55, 65, or 95, right? The thing that you need in order to retire is that you need sufficient assets. And so the goal is to have sufficient assets. That's the FI portion, financial independence. Once you have sufficient assets, it's then up to you to decide what you want to do with that, whether you want to retire or you want to keep stay in your job. The options are open to you. And so the focus is how do you accumulate enough money, typically through market investments, um, though it could be any any other range of investments or any other forms of residual income. And, and that comes from accumulating assets and uh, you know the fact that right now um, you're getting started during what seems to be a pullback is, uh, is it just gives you an accelerant. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about that kind of, you know, financial independence and, and retiring early aspect of things. Gorick, uh, you've been a big advocate of, of trying to kind of make sure that you're getting the most out of uh, your workplace retirement programs, the benefits that you have from a financial standpoint, investing in things like Roth IRAs and everything else for retirements. So here's a question for you from Dariana Davis with her question. What are financial benefits that students can take advantage of as interns to start making good decisions with our money early on? Thank you. All right, so Gorick, this is kind of right up, right up your alley here, right in your wheelhouse. What do you think? Yeah, well, Dariana, the fact that you're even asking this question so early on means that you're making the right decisions for a solid financial and professional future. No matter if you're an intern, a new grad, or really just anyone in the workforce, there are five key areas that you should be paying attention to because many people overlook these opportunities. The one is your Roth IRA and your Roth 401k. This is a topic that we've come back to time and time again because it matters. This is an account that allows you to take a portion of your earnings, put it into an account, invest it, and have those earnings grow tax-free which may not sound like much right now as a student or as an intern, but over time could lead to hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional savings than if you didn't have this account. 
And many employers will also offer matching, which is a fancy way of saying that for every dollar you put into this account, your employer will put an additional dollar, which also means that if you say no to such an option, what you're really doing is you're saying no to free money that your employer was already prepared to give you. So make sure you take advantage of that opportunity. Second one is around employee stock purchasing pro programs or plans. This is an option that many companies will offer to their employees to buy their stock at often a slightly at, at a slight discount. So if you're working, for example, at an early stage startup and you're excited about and optimistic about its future trajectory, this is your chance to potentially get in early before it's open to the, the public markets. The third one are tuition reimbursement programs or tuition assistance programs. These are opportunities for you to take night school, online courses, maybe graduate school or a boot camp that would allow you to accelerate your career, build solid skills, and have this be paid for by your employer. The fourth are, are discounts that you can get from your employer or allowances. I've worked, for example, at companies that will have discounted transit passes, discounted museum passes. I had an employer who offered free bicycles and tune-ups to their employees. Others that I've seen offer free books uh, every month over a course of an allowance. Again, these are opportunities that your employer has already allocated funds towards. It's really up to you to take advantage of that opportunity. And then the final one, the fifth one, is not something that we often think of as a financial benefit, but that really is a financial benefit. And these are loyalty programs and credit card points. So if you're in a job, for example, where you're traveling a lot, booking accommodations, or maybe even just paying for catering and swiping that credit card, this is an opportunity for you to find a cashback credit card with airline points, for example, and or sign up for a loyalty program such that every time you spend money, you're actually getting a portion of that back to your own account. These are all ways to set yourself up for financial success. And to Gorg's point, one of the biggest things I love in my household is we use those cashback cards. So there's like credit cards where they just give you like one, two, three, four X percent back on certain types of purchases, whether it's groceries or gas or anything else like that. So definitely something that I'm, I'm taking advantage of right now as well. So we've got another investing question coming up here. This, this is from a 24 year old. This is Alex E2. And let's listen to what Alex's question is. Hello, and thank you for having me. I'm wondering, what are some common mistakes people make when investing? And when should they hire a professional to help manage their investments? Thank you. Okay, that's easy. Let's go to the financial professional, the one who gets paid to manage money. And I can answer that's that. You. That's you. That's what Sagement does. That's me. That is what Sagement Wealth does. So let's see what, how, how would you respond to Alex's question then? So I would tell Alex that unless you're doing this for a living, everybody can benefit from professional financial advice. Now, it does depend on where you are in life and you know where you are with, with investing and cash flow, but everybody can benefit from financial professional financial advice because there are so many things to consider when you talk about investing and looking at your overall plan and your strategy. And so making sure that you work with a financial advisor to come up with a long-term plan, come up with what are your goals and how do we reach those goals by creating a plan. And then when it comes to investing too, you know, the investment world is robust. There are so many things out there that individuals can invest in. And we can educate ourselves through watching CNBC and reading blogs and books, but there are so many things that you have to keep up with. And so my advice is, you know, depending on where you are, there are different levels of financial advisors that you can work with to help you get started to being full financial advisors that help oversee your plan and help you choose your investments. Um, so there are a lot of different advisors out there, but definitely everybody has a need for a professional financial um, advisor. All right, that's a great question there from Alex E2. Thank you very much for that. We appreciate it. Uh, now let's go back out to the Golden State of California, specifically Oakland this time, and get another question from one of our viewers out there. Hello, my name is Ricky Lamb, and thank you so much for taking my question. With current market conditions, the generally unsettling state of our economy, and the new digital normal, how should college students and recent graduates plan their long-term investments, short-term investments, and individual entrepreneurial projects. Thank you. All right, so maybe we'll go to 
Paula for this mm -hmm. one here. I mean, you've got a pretty unique path given what we saw in your video bio to, to you know, your traditional job uh, and then kind of leaving that, going on to start Afford Anything, becoming financially independent. We'll see if it's the retire early part anytime soon. So, yep. so what, what do you think? I mean, how exactly should you approach this from a kind of bigger picture macro standpoint about, you know, the younger side of things and, and, and how you tackle the, some of those resource issues? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so well, I'll address all three of those. So there's long-term investments, which is make sure that you have some type of asset allocation, which is just a fancy way of saying your mix of different types of investments, stocks, bonds, cash or cash equivalents, commodities, uh, maybe a small cryptocurrency allocation if if you want to. Right? Make Think about that overall portfolio, think about how you wanna slice it and come up with an asset allocation that is aligned with your age, your timeline, your goals, and uh, and your tolerance for risk, right? Are you the type of person, psychologically or behaviorally, who is going to stay up at night or panic uh, during a market decline? So designing a portfolio, designing an asset allocation that fits you in terms of the, the specifics of your timeline, your goals, and your risk tolerance, that's how to plan long-term investments. And that holds true regardless of what's happening in, in the market. Uh, in terms of short-term investments, and I'm going to define short-term as money that you're going to need in the next, we'll say, five years or less, right? That's money that you don't want to expose to an undue amount of risk because if you need to tap that money in the next five years, maybe in order to start your business or to make a down payment on a home or to uh, have a wedding or, or anything that you might want to do with that money, your goal is not maximum growth for that money. Your goal is simply to keep it uh, in some type of uh, asset that will help it keep pace with inflation, you know, so you don't want to lose purchasing power, but you don't want to expose, you're not trying to optimize that money, right? So you're going to look for the types of assets, uh, like something like treasury inflation protected securities um, that can help you keep pace with inflation, but not expose it to too much risk. And then to the third part of your question, and Dom, this actually uh, ties in with what you said about the, the, and I'm glad you talked about this, the distinction between the FI and the RE, right? Um, I never, ever, ever, ever want to retire. Uh, my prayer is that when I am 250 years old, I will be in good enough health that I can continue to do the work that I'm doing. And that's because the work that I'm doing has autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so, um, to your goal of starting some type of entrepreneurial venture, I think that's absolutely wonderful. And make sure that wh whatever it is that you decide to invest your time, your energy, your hours towards, make it uh, something that is that Venn diagram intersection between what something that you would never want to retire from, right? Something that you would love to do, uh, the Venn diagram intersection of that with what the world needs and what the world will pay you for and test that, you know, um, make small bets and test to make sure that people will buy this. All right. That's a great answer because now I'm, I'm kind of soaking this all in right now, but mm -hmm. I, I, I think that I want to take that last part of your question, the one about trying to figure out what people will pay you for, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, many of us still do have traditional jobs, you know, myself included. I, I still work, and by the way, for a very large corporation in Comcast, NBC Universal. So what about the, the younger folks? And, and Gorik, this is a good question for you that's geared a little bit more towards how a younger person goes about kind of optimizing their traditional job. Take a listen to this one. Hello, my name is Denise Quintanilla, and thank you so much for taking my question today. I'm curious if you have any advice on how to negotiate salary, especially if you're new to the industry. How do you know what you should be asking for and what you deserve? And do you have any tips to getting that salary? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Gorik, I'm listening intently. And I, 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 I don't know if my bosses are listening to me right now, but I, I'd like to go into my next salary negotiation with some tips. So what do you what advice do you have for Denise here? My advice for Denise is to be mindful of the three pillars or the three levers rather that you can pull to negotiate that salary, which I think of as your salary matching, salary parity, and or salary equivalency. Now, what do I mean by this this jargon? When it comes to salary matching, if you happen to have two job offers, ideally from two companies that see each other as competitors, 
and one company is willing to pay you more than the other one, you now have an opportunity to go to one of those companies, the one that's paying you less, and to say, as I think about where I'd like to take my career next, I'd love to have that career next step be with you all. I have at the same time received this other offer with this expiry date that's paying me this amount. What would it take for us to talk about an increase in my base salary or my signing bonus in order to match this other offer that I've received? That salary matching. When it comes to salary parity, this is where you have an opportunity to do some research and to come to the table with your homework. There are a number of websites that you can refer to, whether it's glassdoor.com, whether it's levels.fyi, whether it's teamblind.com or even reddit.com. These are all platforms where the wisdom of the crowds has crowdsourced how much people are earning in their respective jobs and respective companies. And just a simple Google search or a quick browse through of these platforms can give you a pretty good sense of whether you're getting paid at the level that others are. Now, of course, you can't trust everything that you read online. So when in doubt, contact a trusted mentor or get introduced to someone who's worked at this company to understand how others are being paid such that you can come to the table now and ask if it would be possible to reach parity, to essentially reach the salary that others at your experience level and tenure are receiving as well. It's just a matter of fairness. And the final one is around equivalency. And this is a chance for you to think about where this team, where this department, where this company perhaps is looking to take itself over the next 6, 12, 18 months and what skills, what educational backgrounds, what work experiences they might be looking for that you can bring to the table. And this is a chance for you to take stock of everything you've done, all the education that you've accumulated and all the skills that you have and to come to the table and say, well, as I think about where this team is going next, I'd love to be able to do this, 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 and this. I'd love to be able to bring these skills to bear and I have relevant experience in all of these different ways. What would it look like for us to be able to talk about increasing the salary to this level. Now, so far we've talked about the base salary. Sometimes you can pull another lever, which is the lever of a signing bonus or a relocation bonus. And then on the non-monetary side, if you, even if you are able to get the company to budge on the monetary front, you can also negotiate other elements. For example, you can, you can negotiate when you start your job. You can negotiate the types of educational and career development benefits. You might even be able to negotiate your job title. So think about what you're being offered. Think about whether this matches with what you're seeing and what you're hearing about from others and also about what you want and then ask for what you deserve. All right, that's fantastic. I, I mean, this idea here of just understanding, but I think that the, the bottom line for, for Agoric, uh, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there is a good amount of a kind of homework that you want to do, right? This idea that you want to understand the field, the playing field around you and seeing kind of how you fit into that whole scheme of things. That's, that's going to be key no matter what. It's not just salary negotiation, by the way. It's just everything about your workplace that you have, you have, you have to kind of pay a little bit more attention to there. Um, so so, so let, let's kind of talk a little bit more about one other aspect of work. And, and that's not necessarily the, the traditional work aspect or, or kind of like the, the day job, so to speak, right? During the pandemic, so many of us have, have had to kind of become creative with regard to understanding how to kind of either make ends meet or try to thrive a little bit in a time where many things were closed off to us. And for that, we, we turn to the what's affectionately known in, in, in the professional world these days as the side hustle, right? This kind of like you got your day job, but I'm doing some stuff on the side, either that I like doing or that I have a, a certain amount of market value for. And, and whether that's driving for Uber or Lyft or a ride share, delivering food, doing whatever it is, um, helping people consult, whatever it is. Let's talk a little bit about the side hustle. So we've got a question now with regard to how you tackle that. Let's take a listen. Hi, my name is Katie Hopsaker, and I'm a student at Syracuse University. It seems like everyone has a side hustle right now, but I want to know if it's really necessary to have one to gain financial freedom, or should you just focus on one main job? Thank you so much for having me. Okay, Paula. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of fits in the, the this whole idea of financial independence or, and or retiring early. So what are your thoughts? Do I need to get a side hustle right now to bring in some extra money? Or what exactly do I have to do to evaluate whether that's the right choice for me? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, ultimately what matters is 
the size of the gap between how much you earn and how much you spend. And there are only two ways to increase the size of that gap. You can either earn more, you can spend less, or you can do a combination of the two. But ultimately, those are the only ways to grow the gap. So if you look at the earn more side of the equation, what you want to choose is whatever is the most uh, time efficient and, and, and energy kind of spirit uh, efficient way of earning more. And a lot of that is going to depend on what industry you're in. If you are in a very high paying field, and I, I know you're a college student right now, but I, I don't know what you're majoring in, um, depending on the ultimate industry that you end up working in, you might be in a very high paying profession where it's a better use of your time to go for promotions or to even consult or freelance within your field of expertise because you are in a very high paying type of role. If that's not the case, um, if you are in uh, the type of industry or the type of occupation where there just isn't a whole lot of financial upside, then starting a side hustle could be a more efficient route to earning more. But at the end of the day, also ultimately what matters is the fact that you are earning more. And really beyond that, it's the fact that you are increasing the gap between what you earn and what you spend. So, so if I could follow up with that, uh, with Anne, um, given the kind of financial advisor side of things, uh, w when you take a look at some of those answers, Anne, and, and you look at whether or not somebody should be focusing on their day job at this younger kind of stage of life uh, versus kind of a pursuing the side hustle, are there, are there kind of financial advisory aspects or, or are there kind of financial planning aspects that you might have to have a conversation with a client about? with regard to how much time or energy they should devote to a side hustle or kind of like that balance between devoting too much to the side hustle and not focusing on the day job, so to speak. How does all that play out in, in your mind? All right, so I think, I think when we're looking at a side hustle, it really depends on where you are in life, right? So I think if you're a college student, you have the ability to spend a lot of hours working and trying to figure out what that career, focusing on your career, maybe creating a side hustle. If you are starting a family, you may not have the time commitment, right? So one of the things that we do with our clients is really sit down and help them come up with a plan that works for them, right? And, and a side hustle may sound good, but what really are you going to have to put into it, right? So it's like creating a business with any business that you start, what are you gonna to have to invest into it to get some type of return? And does that make sense for you? Uh, from a financial standpoint, right? And so the time, the hours, the money, all of that really is a factor that you need to consider to see if it makes sense. Now, if this is a side hustle, you're in a job that you're unhappy, right? That you don't find joy and fulfillment in, that you think the side hustle could become a full-fledged business, then that might be something to consider, right? So I think it depends on what you're looking at, what you're trying to do, the time and effort it's going to take, and really how much of an investment will it take from you? And making sure that you understand all of the data and facts of what the side hustle will entail and how much it will take from you in the, you know, currently and in the future. Oh, and by the way, I mean, for all, I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of the, the, the audience right now, the viewers and listeners out there, are fully aware that that we have this great platform at CNBC called CNBC Make It, which is geared especially towards kind of like entrepreneurs achieving financial freedom and everything. And I can't tell you how many, every time I see a story or a link that says something along the lines of this person turned their side hustle into an X thousand dollar a month business, I always click on it because I wonder what it's like when somebody kind of has that change in tack in their career where they find the side hustle, but then figure out at some miraculous point that they can make more money doing that that side hustle that they love versus kind of their day job. I mean, it's just there's so many great entrepreneurship stories out there. So certainly something, by the way, if you haven't checked out that part of our website, you should because it, they're just great stories. Anyway, Gorik, I'd like to also focus on this kind of job aspect of things uh, a little bit more. We'll get a little bit more towards the investing side, maybe a little bit if we have pro program time here. But but I, I my understanding is that when you were younger, you actually helped your mother. We, we saw her and, and, and that beautiful photo of you and her in, 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 the, in the video reel before. You helped your mother actually apply for jobs. You, you figured out how to, to write a resume. You figured out how to write cover letters and, and, and then learned a lot more when you arrived at Harvard. Um, you've often been kind of espousing this point that when you're looking for a job, it's not necessarily a job search, but more of a job hunt. To me, they sound the same, but there's a nuance there. Can you take us through what that is? 
Definitely. The job search was what my mom and I were going through and frankly going through through trial and error. A job hunt is what those who end up getting in and getting ahead have as a mindset. When most of us go through the job search, what we're doing is going online, opening up a dozen browser tabs, and then aimlessly scrolling through the job postings in search of something that seems like it could be a fit. But what we're doing in doing so is only seeing a fraction of the opportunities that could be available to us. What does a job board represent? Well, it represents the positions that have been posted and that are available right now. What you're not seeing are the jobs that could be posted next week, that could be posted next month, that could be created. It's just that no one had taken the time to create an actual job posting out of it. And so a job search isn't only limiting in terms of what you see, but also whether you get seen. And so when I was going through this process with my mom, we were aimlessly clicking submit as well on every job posting, not realizing that in doing so, we were just putting her resume and cover letter onto a big virtual pile that may never even get looked at. Nowadays, I espouse the idea of a job hunt, which is to think about what you even want short-term and long-term, and then thinking about what you want versus what is available. What does that look like? Well, short run, thinking about are there specific companies and organizations that you are already interested in? And are there certain job titles or types of work that you would like to be doing? The intersection of an organization and a job is a role. And that now allows you to do a much more targeted search on Google or on any of these job boards to see if something's available. And just because something is available doesn't mean it can't be available or that it can't be created. And so this is also your chance to dig through the people you know, take a look at how many of them work at organizations that you're interested in or in the profession that you're interested in. And if you don't have such people, asking for an introduction saying, I noticed that you're connected to so-and-so, would you happen to be close enough to them to make an introduction? I'd love to follow in their footsteps and pick their brain about A, B, and C. Or if both of those options are unavailable, finding someone who's been in your shoes before, cold emailing them, messaging them on LinkedIn, and seeing if they would be able to share their insights with you. What you want to ultimately be doing is showing up as a person and not just as an anonymous cover letter or resume. And then long-term, it's also helpful to think about whether you want a job that is a stepping stone to a broader opportunity. Your first job won't be your last job. This next job unlikely will be your last job either. It'll be a stepping stone. And so what I encourage young people to do is to go onto LinkedIn, find folks that they look up to and potentially want to become, open those browser tabs, scroll all the way down to the very start of their profile, and then read their bio from the bottom up and see what choices they made, what career transitions they made, how long they stayed at a certain organization. And in doing so, you're able to see, oh, it seems like this job is actually a job for me two steps from now. The best way to set myself up for this opportunity is to jump from here to here in this sequence in this time period. Again, folks have been in your shoes before, learn from their mistakes. It's so crazy because, I mean, a, a lot of folks, you know, in, in, in at least at, here at CNBC and in, 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 in my prior life, I mean, I was a Wall Street guy by, you know, I, first of all, I was a hotel and restaurant management major in college, to kind of Paula's point, that then went on to a career in Wall Street during the dot-com boom, that then pivoted to broadcast journalism during the great financial crisis. So for me, all of those stories resonate because it's not necessarily that you're stuck into one particular track. There are so many different options out there if you kind of expose yourself to opportunity. And, and those opportunities are, are constantly out there. It's just about whether or not you wanna kind of pursue them or not. One of the things that really helped me make up my mind was having great you know, coaches, I guess, if you will. Mentors, I guess, is the key word that people call them these days. Uh, you know, Anne, maybe I'll turn to you for this one here. I, I've had amazing mentors in, in both my Wall Street career and in my journalism kind of media career. Uh, did you have like some of those mentor types growing up? Uh, do, do you have any advice for anyone that's hoping to, to kind of either get into the financial industry or any industry uh, of that? How exactly do you leverage that, that kind of mentor-mentee relationship to help you really progress? I was very lucky to have a lot of great mentors throughout my career. I think in 
every every industry that you enter, it's so critical to try and find a mentor to help guide you and help them, you know, allow them to teach you, you know, what it takes to succeed in this industry, what they had to do and learn from, like Gord said, learn from their mistakes and also learn the steps that they took. And so I was very fortunate to come across a lot of different mentors that helped guide me through this. Um, now, one thing that I did struggle with, and I will say, is finding mentors that looked like me, right? And so in the financial services industry, that was a, a huge problem for me to find another female Asian advisor that I could look to for advice. And so now, you know, I will say the industry has changed tremendously. Um, I'm a part of LPL Financial's Advisor Inclusion Council. One of our missions is to bring diversity, equity, and inclusion into the financial services industry and make it a more supportive and inclusive environment for younger advisors to want to come in and enter the financial world. And one of the things that I recommend is really to reach out, like Gork mentioned, LinkedIn has been a fantastic fantastic place to really connect with those individuals. It's so simple to look up in Google, do a Google search and look them up on LinkedIn, look at their profile and reach out. And I will say I get a lot of messages from LinkedIn from other younger advisors. And for me, this is my opportunity to, to share what I've learned and to give back. And I think that you'll find that a lot of people are willing to offer advice because they were in your shoes too. We were all there. We all started our career somewhere and we all had help from someone. And so there are a lot of different opportunities and places that you can look to now to find mentors. Um, and I think that it's it's really the, a great place to start would be on LinkedIn. All right, so Anne, I mean, that 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 we, we talked a little bit about the constructive nature of, of coaching and, and, and mentorship and everything else. Uh, Paula, based upon kind of what we know about you and your story, you chose a career path that was unlike anyone else in your family, mm -hmm. uh, you know, perhaps with some kind of stereotypes and generalizations with regard to how your family approached mm -hmm. your career paths and choices and everything. What would you say or advise to, to some of the younger folks out there who are in similar situations, who are navigating something like that, where, where they may not have the complete and utter 100% support uh, from their family with regard to some of the choices that they're making with regard to maybe their career path or what they want to do? Sure. Well, I would say to, to anyone who is facing that same struggle, to anyone who wants to go into a career path that their family doesn't understand and doesn't support, and you know the family keeps warning, keeps warning you, you're going down the wrong path, right? Um, the thing to remember is that the advice that you're hearing from your parents, your uncles, your aunts, um, it come, their impressions come from a different time, a different generation, a different, uh, a different set of circumstances and a different environment, right? Uh, and like, given how quickly the internet world is developing, they, you know, what the, the jobs um, and the opportunities that were available even five years ago or 10 years ago are very different than what's available today. So uh, when you get advice from your family, um, that is very prescriptive and says you need to go down these very specific paths. Um, what they, big picture, what they're really trying to communicate is we want a certain degree of safety or security for you. And based on what we've learned in our lives, these are the paths that give you that safety and security. And so keep that in mind contextually when you're hearing that from them and know that they just don't have the context to understand that the world is different now and you have to adapt and respond to the world as it is, not as it was. All right, that's fantastic. Now, I, I know that I could carry this conversation on forever because I've got so many more questions, but this is the real world and we have a finite amount of time. So I'm gonna end this program by kind of asking each of you to kind of picture yourself uh, back at your college commencement and you have been asked to give the commencement address on behalf of students. And your job is to tell every one of your peers out there what that one piece of advice would be on life, business, investing, entrepreneurship, whatever it was. What are you going to tell them about what the best thing that they can do is going forward? And we'll start maybe with Gorick on this one here. Commencement address. We've got just a few seconds here. Take us through what you'd say. I would say that for every front door are a set of side doors. 
for every advertised opportunity are a set of unadvertised opportunities. For every spoken rule are a set of unspoken rules. And what this means for you and all of us is that just because an opportunity doesn't exist today doesn't mean an opportunity can't be created, can't be created for you, can't be created by you. And so dream up what it is that you truly want, see if someone's done it, contact them if they have, and if not, just because something doesn't exist doesn't mean you can't put it into motion and bring it into this world. All right, and Paula, how about you? I would say uh, be incredibly thoughtful about the hidden trade-offs that you make with every decision. Oftentimes, when you think through a decision, whether it's a career decision, a purchasing decision, an investment decision, it can be very easy to look only at that one choice in a vacuum and think, all right, do I want to do this, yes or no? And to not be really thoughtful or conscious about all of the other things that you're necessarily not doing, all of the opportunity costs that you're passing up by walking down this particular path or walking through a given door. So the big picture idea that I would say to any college graduate is think very carefully about the, the opportunity costs and about the trade-offs whenever you make any decision in any, in any realm of your life. All right, and we'll cap things off with Anne Tran. What's, what, what big piece of advice would you give all of these uh, young folks out there? So my one piece of advice would probably be to focus on the relationships that you make. After college and you graduate, the people that you meet, the connections that you make, the relationships that you build will be instrumental in where your career goes and your life goes. And so making relationships, building relationships, and not just meeting people for the sake of meeting people, but being thoughtful, being intentional about the relationships you build and following up on those relationships will really take you very far. All right, well, thank you all very much for attending Own Your Money Before It Owns You. I wanna give a special thank you to our very, very esteemed guests here, Gora Gang, he's the author of The Unspoken Rules, also to Paula Pant, the Afford Anything podcast host, and who you just heard from, Ann Tran, managing partner at Sage Mint Wealth, uh, an investment advisor who's focused on so many great things right now. Thank you all for sharing your really inspirational stories with us and advice for that next generation. I know that the youth out there and some of the folks in our audience, young or old, uh, may have learned some helpful tips and important takeaways today because it really is all about owning your money before it owns you. Now, if you'd like to watch some of these clips from today's event and you want to learn a little bit more about some of the topics that we discussed, please go over to cnbc.com slash invest in you and be sure to sign up for our Money 101 newsletter at cnbc.com slash money 101 to learn even more about how to kind of manage, grow, protect your money, how to invest, save, job skills and everything else. So great resource for great, great resources rather for all of you guys. Thank you very much again, Gorick, Paula, and Anne. My name's Dominic Chu from CNBC. So let's all keep rising and keep growing, and we'll do it together. We'll see you soon.